I want to say ball. Okay, sure. Ball. Another ball I want to say. Okay. Ball. Okay, so this is the second video now in section four. And what we're going to do in this one is we're going to look at Bernoulli's equation. This is a really important equation that tells us the relationship between pressure and velocity. And that's something that we use quite a bit in practice. For example, when we're looking at race car designs, we'll mention this a lot in the wind tunnel lab that's coming up, for example. Uh, then we'll also take a look at different definitions of pressure. Uh, and in this video, we'll be wrapping up uh, section four. Okay, so here's the breakdown of section four with uh, what will be covered in this video in the white text. So it's Bernoulli's equation, then looking at three different types of pressure, static, stagnation, and dynamic. We'll finish with a visualization using the energy grade line and hydraulic grade line. And then alongside this video will be example 4.2, which will be in another video. And I'll be using Bernoulli's equation in that example to solve for flow through a nozzle. So Bernoulli's equation is a really important equation in fluid mechanics. It comes up all the time, and it's also been noted as being one of the most misused equations in fluid mechanics. So it'll be really important here for us to see roughly where it comes from and then how to use it. So we start with Euler's equation there using streamline coordinates. So that's applicable along a streamline. And then if we remember, basically that's a force balance. So it's talking about a fluid particle that moves along a streamline. And if we say this particle moves a distance ds along the streamline, we can multiply this expression by ds. And then essentially what we're doing is that's the force expression there times a distance. And again, I'll just, I'll give you a second to figure that out. So force times a distance is what? If we remember back, we can check our units. Remember back to physics. What we get when we do force times a distance is energy, right? This is why we see the Bernoulli equation is really an expression of energy. And we're going to go ahead and integrate that. So we go from all these differential forms to the total. All right, so we go ahead and integrate all of those. And in this time, instead of having the limits of integration put right in, we just leave the constant in this time. So that's the famous Bernoulli equation there. We take a look at that. We see that that's an energy balance. So we've got the half V squared there. We know that's kinetic energy. GZ, we know that's potential energy. And then what we're calling that pressure term is the flow energy there. We say that's equal to a constant. And we're going to do an example later to show how this is used. Very, very extremely important equation, but also one of the most misused equations. So remember, you need to be really careful when you use Bernoulli's equation. So the restrictions are very explicitly listed right here. We have to remember it's only applicable for steady flow, incompressible flow, frictionless flow, right? Inviscid flows, and only when you have flow along a streamline, right? We derived this expression just now along a streamline. You have to remember it's only applicable along a streamline. So what you can do that in that case is if you're looking at a streamline and you know this expression has to be constant, it's basically saying if you measure one pressure at point one, this term has to be constant. So it has to be equal to some point further along the streamline, right? We'll call that point two. Often cases we don't have much of an elevation change. So in practice, we're typically going to get rid of this term. And this is often how we're going to use this equation. So for example, that will help us relate pressure changes to velocity changes. You know the pressure and velocity at some point one, you can figure out pressure and velocity at some point two. So generally, if I know the pressure at point one and the pressure at point two, I know the velocity of either one of them, I can figure out what that velocity is. You see, that's how we're relating these pressures and velocities here. And the implication of Bernoulli is because this stays constant, it's essentially saying you have pressure, so your flow energy, and you have your kinetic energy. And essentially, any time you interchange between them, they have to stay balanced, they have to stay constant, right? So if pressure goes up, velocity has to go down and vice versa, right? Very important to understand the physical nature of this expression. So a good example of this is what we can see in race cars. And we'll talk about this a lot in the wind tunnel lab that's coming up. So any places around the vehicle, for example, where the velocity increases, right? So if V goes up, pressure goes down. And that lower pressure at certain points around the vehicle exerts a force. Same thing if the velocity slows down. Right? If V goes down, pressure goes up, and, and that pressure also exerts a force on the vehicle. A neat example of this 
is on the underside of race cars. So if you can accelerate the flow under the vehicle, right? So if you increase the V under the vehicle, you decrease the P. So you decrease the pressure. That lower pressure under the vehicle, it's known as ground effects, that pulls the vehicle down towards the road. Gives you downforce, right? Gives you more traction. So that's kind of a cool way we actually use the Bernoulli's equation. It also plays a core part in the principles of lift. We'll see that later as well. And so this interchange relationship between pressure and velocity is actually a very useful tool we can use in fluid mechanics, as engineers especially. Now we're gonna look at pressure measurements. We're gonna walk through now static stagnation and dynamic pressure. Okay, so firstly, we're gonna talk about what static stagnation and dynamic pressures are, so how they're defined, and then we're gonna look at how they're measured and why, what, you know, what the basic use is for these three different pressures. So we've seen from Bernoulli that we have to have an energy balance and that generally velocity and pressure become interchangeable. So this section is really gonna show us how we take advantage of that. So what we call static pressure, also known as the thermodynamic pressure, that's the same P that you would have seen in thermodynamics. So that's the pressure experienced by a fluid particle as it's moving. Seems to be a little counterintuitive there. The static pressure is the pressure experienced as it moves, but we'll see why when you see how to measure that, we'll see why it makes sense to call that the static pressure. Stagnation pressure is the pressure obtained when a flowing fluid is decelerated to zero, and the dynamic pressure is the pressure that's due to the flow velocity. So we'll see in our example here, the dynamic pressure is the difference between the stagnation and the static pressure. Okay, but we're gonna need examples of this to, to make heads or tails of what's going on here. So we look at these first pictures here. These are showing static pressures. So a static pressure is the pressure experienced by a fluid particle as it moves. So to get a measurement on that, we know from the analysis we did previously that we can't have a pressure change across straight streamlines. So if I place a pressure tap at the bottom of this duct shown here on the left, if you put a pressure tap there, you know it's the same pressure that you're experiencing across those straight streamlines, so long as there's no appreciable friction. We use these same kind of pressure taps on the race car in the wind tunnel. Specifically, we put them along the end plate at the edge of the wing so we can measure the pressure there and get the pressure distribution. Another way to do this too is in part B there, you see a static pressure probe. So there's a probe that can be inserted into the flow and then you have small holes on the side. And that's the same kind of thing. You're measuring the static pressure because the fluid is flowing. So the particle has to be moving and then you get the static pressure. Now, what is stagnation pressure? So for that, we look at a pitot tube and that's the pressure we get when a fluid is decelerated to zero. So in that case, you would have a hole that's facing the flow. So in this case, what happens is you have all this flow in the direction of this hole here. So that's causing the fluid to decelerate to zero and measuring the stagnation pressure. And that opening is connected to a pressure measurement gauge, which blocks it off. So none of that flow can flow down that hole. And that's why all the flow is stopped. All right, that's how we measure it. Let's look at an equation for what this actually means. And then we'll talk about some practical examples so we can really wrap our heads around what these different things mean here. So we're gonna use the Bernoulli equation, but as we commonly do, we'll neglect the elevation change. So that's what's listed right here. So on the left-hand side, we're going to consider a case where the flow is decelerated to zero. So like right at the tip of the pitot tube. So V naught's gonna be zero. So that pressure we're measuring there, that corresponds to the stagnation pressure then, P naught. And on the right-hand side, we're gonna consider the flowing fluid before it was decelerated, right? So in that case, the P that's measured there is the static pressure and the velocity is the velocity that we're seeing above in our example of the pressure tap there. So the flowing velocity. Okay, now when we rearrange that, we notice the difference between the stagnation and static pressure is what we call the dynamic pressure. Okay, so what's going on here? So we have the stagnation pressure, which is the pressure the fluid experiences when we decelerate it. So what we're doing there is we're capturing all of that kinetic energy, right? So I always find the best way to think about this is to use the example, again, of when you put your hand up in the air, right? So we talked about how if you're in a static room, you put your hand up in the air, you don't feel any of that pressure right? It's all atmospheric pressure. Now, what happens if you stick your hand up and there's flow, for example, let's say there's a very strong wind. So now you feel that wind, right? So when your hand is raised in the air there, the atmospheric pressure, that's corresponding to the static pressure. So that's the pressure the fluid's experiencing as it flows. 
but your hand, the flow in the middle of your hand is causing the air to decelerate there to zero. So the flow stops. So what you feel pushing against your hand now is the dynamic pressure. So all of that velocity, all of that kinetic energy, when you force it to stop, that has to be converted into a pressure, right? So all of that kinetic energy now gets converted to the pressure energy and you feel the stagnation pressure, which is much higher. So we see in the equation, the stagnation pressure is the static pressure. So in, in our case, the atmospheric pressure. And then the velocity of the wind is our half rho v squared term there. That's causing us to feel this higher stagnation pressure. So we think of then the stagnation pressure as just the pressure when you're also considering all of that kinetic energy that the flow has. It's actually quite easy to measure both of these things. You can literally just have an opening at the side of a duct connected to a pressure gauge. And we've seen actually that could just be as simple as a manometer. Then that's your static pressure tap. And then a pitot tube, you literally just insert a probe into the flow with a little hole that's facing the flow and you can measure stagnation pressure. So it's really easy to measure these two things, but what's complicated to measure is velocity. It's extremely hard to measure velocity but extremely easy to measure pressure. So when we rearrange this equation, we see that if you rearrange it for velocity, all you need to do in that case then is measure a static and a stagnation pressure and you can figure out the velocity of your flow. So in cases where it's challenging to measure velocity, this is a really simple way to measure velocity, right? Just by using the pressures. And again, we see the value of section four here in knowing the relationship between velocities and pressure. Okay, now show them here are some ways we can measure both at the same time. So you'll have a setup like this. Oftentimes what we're looking for is a velocity. That's the information we need. But again, remember pressure can be important as well. So in a case where we need to get velocity, we need both of these pressures. The case on the left, there's a static tap and a pitot tube. So you measure both. And we'll just notice in that case, generally the tube itself is located away from the static opening and downstream of it so it doesn't interfere with that measurement. And then another way to do it is to use a pitot tube, but you can actually have static pressure holes at the side. So in that case, you'd make sure no flow actually comes down through the line in C. So it's just hooked up to a pressure reading. So a point B there, you're getting the stagnation pressure, right, where the flow decelerates. And then at C, you're getting the flow flowing over the side. So that's a static pressure reading. And then you compare the two and you can get your velocity. So that's how it's generally done in practice. Really can use either setup. So really what we're doing in practice here is you're just measuring two pressures and then calculating for a velocity. So that's really just plug and play there on that equation. All right, now moving forward, the final thing we're gonna do in section four here is to look at the energy grade line and hydraulic grade line. So this is really just visualization tool. Okay, so basically what we're doing is developing a strategy so we can just visualize stagnation and static pressures. So if we take our expression for the Bernoulli equation, divide by G, we have this expression here, and then instead of saying that's equal to a constant, what we do is we call that the head. So that capital H there is the total head of the flow. And we can see just from a quick look at the left-hand side, we must have a unit balance. Each of these terms has to have the same unit, right? So we see we've got that Z term on the left-hand side there, and that's gonna have units of distance, right? Meters, generally speaking. So that means that on the right-hand side, that total head there, that's gonna be measured in a distance as well. Okay, so that total head is representing the total energy of the flow, all of the terms in our Bernoulli equation. So we can also call that the EGL. So that stands for energy grade line, and it's corresponding to a distance value, or, or we can say a height value, right? So this is where we can get our visual. We're just gonna say whatever height that is at the EGL there, we can just draw that into a figure. All right, in the line below it, the HGL there, that's the hydraulic grade line. So in that case, we're not gonna include the kinetic energy term. We're just gonna look at the pressure. So what that one there is, that's just the static pressure, right? So the static pressure doesn't include the kinetic energy term. So HGL is just gonna be the height of the column that corresponds to just the static pressure. And of course, the difference between the two is the kinetic energy term that we removed. So we know anytime we're plotting this, we look at the difference between the height at the EGL and the HGL, and that's gonna correspond to the energy that was converted into kinetic energy. All right, so this is a visual tool. So what does this look like? We're, of course, we're gonna have to look at it. All right, so we've got a, a system here with a flowing fluid. So on the left, we have a large reservoir. And then as the fluid flows towards the right, we basically have an outlet pipe there that changes into 
diameter. So at each point of this system, we can actually use our tool here, our EGL and HGL, to figure out what's going on. So basically, if we were to measure the stagnation pressure and static pressure at each point, we can plot out our energy grade line and hydraulic grade line, right? Okay, so let's look at this figure and really dive in here. So at point one, we're in the reservoir, the fluid's not moving at all. So if we were to take a reading of the static pressure and the stagnation pressure, they would be the same. So that's why at point one there, our energy grade line and hydraulic grade line are overlapping. All right, now at this moment, we're starting to have the fluid flow. So it's having a velocity because it's flowing down into this channel. So the energy grade line here is the dash line at the top. And we notice that stays the same. Now that makes sense because that's the value that has to remain constant. That's just our Bernoulli equation divided by gravity, right? So that has to remain constant because the energy has to be balanced. And it's really key to note here, right? We're considering frictionless cases. Now we're gonna go into the friction cases later, but I think if we're gonna do a little bit of forecasting here, we understand that once we go and introduce friction, we're gonna actually drop the energy of the system as we flow. So some of that energy is gonna be converted into friction. So that's actually gonna to correspond to a loss of pressure in our systems. But don't worry about that now. Frictionless cases, energy grade line is constant. Constant when it's frictionless. So that's just a straight line there. We just plot that height the whole way across. So as we track our HGL, our hydraulic grade line, that term is just relating to the pressure, the static pressure of our system without including the kinetic energy. So the difference between the two is that V squared over 2G term. So as we have some of the pressure here converted into the velocity, we see our hydraulic grade line drop. So now at point two here, we have a flow velocity. So all of that initial pressure energy has now been converted. Some of it is kinetic energy and some of it is pressure energy. Okay, now the hydraulic grade line will drop, right, corresponding to the fact that we had that flow velocity, but we won't actually notice it continue to drop unless we have a change, right, or an increase in that flow velocity. So that's why it remains straight there once you have all the velocity flowing in the pipe. So then what's happening there? What's causing it to drop at point two? Okay, I'll give you a second to think about that. We can see from the figure, take a look at the figure as you're thinking this through. I'm gonna continue here, so pause it for a second if you wanna figure it out. We know that velocity can only change because of our mass balance. Velocity can only change when area changes. I mean, or when density changes, but we're incompressible in this case. So we can only have velocity changes corresponding to area. So when we see the diameter of the pipe gets smaller, the area is getting smaller. So this is what's causing the velocity increase through this pipe. As the velocity increases, right, we have to have a pressure drop. We have to be converting that pressure into that kinetic energy. It's the only way we can make sure there's an energy balance. So as we draw the hydraulic grade line, as this velocity increases, now our static pressure continues to drop. And so at point four there, that height corresponds to the V squared over 2G value, where the V is now even faster because we've narrowed the pipe down, so the flow is higher with a lower area. And then it stays flat again past that point because we don't have any further acceleration of the flow. In this case, these Z values are a baseline value to our datum, which is shown in the plot there as the Z equals zero point. And we can see from the equation, that term is added to both of the equations. That's why our comparison between the two still gives us V squared over 2G. That's the only difference between the two. So now what's neat about this figure is we're actually showing a static pressure tab at point two, for example. So we see very clearly, right, how that height measurement corresponds to the height that we're plotting in the hydraulic grade line. And then if you were to take a pitot tube measurement where you decelerate the flow, you're actually capturing that kinetic energy in that case. So that's giving you the energy grade line value. Same thing shown at point four there, static pressure measurement versus stagnation pressure measurement. All right, so that's just a nice visual representation of what's going on here when we're transferring between kinetic energy and pressure energy. And it's kind of neat to look at our system. Anytime you're sort of confused about where your energy is going, whether it's transferring between pressure and velocity, you could look at a plot like this and you can see the difference between those two lines corresponds to our increase of kinetic energy. So that's really just a neat visual tool there which can come in handy in some uh, engineering cases. Okay, so a quick summary of this video. We started with Bernoulli's equation, and we saw that one way to get it is from Euler's equation, where you're essentially multiplying the force balance by a distance. So therefore, the Bernoulli's equation we saw is really an energy balance. And what that showed us was that to keep the energy balanced, velocity and pressure have to trade off against one another. This is the most powerful way we use Bernoulli's equation. So we saw that when velocity is increased, pressure must decrease. And also when velocity is decreased, pressure increases. And with some examples of, you know, vehicles, specifically race cars, generation of lift using wings, it's a very important principle to understand in fluid mechanics. So then we looked at three different types of pressure, static pressure, stagnation pressure, and dynamic pressure 
pressure. And that's really taking advantage of this idea that the pressure and the kinetic energy have to balance. So really, anytime you accelerate a flow, you have to be dropping its pressure. And so what we can do is to measure both the static and stagnation pressure, we can actually calculate the velocity because that must have been the dynamic pressure term. Then we looked at a way to visualize that with our energy grade line and hydraulic grade lines. And that just provides a neat visualization tool. Okay, and that's all for video number 11. Bye.